Hello everybody, welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel, this is Moshix. And today we're going to be looking at the very basics of getting MVS 3.8 as delivered by the uh, TK4 package or distribution to run on Windows. I'm going to be making a Linux version of this uh, same video, uh, but the two platforms are significantly different. Um, and that it makes it necessary to uh, have two different videos on the subject. Um, I'm going to be uh, doing this video from the scratch, uh, from the bottom up, um, meaning um, we're going to be uh, doing the whole part of Hercules installation. Afterwards, we're going to install a terminal emulator. We're going to go and obtain MVS 3.8 and start it and, and log in and do the very basic few things uh, so that we can have a successful Cobalt compile and uh, look at some output. Uh, the reason I'm doing this video is that I've been receiving uh, dozens of uh, comments in the videos and messages and even some emails asking me to do a beginner, an introduction to MBS uh, 3.8. Before we get there, I just want to say um, one, two more things. Uh, number one, uh, if anybody out there has a ZOS system which would allow me to have a non-privileged TSO login so I could do some videos on uh, the modern COBOL uh, compiler as well as um, I wanted to look also a little bit at Rex especially because um, we don't have Rex on MBS 3.8 um, and so I wanted to do uh, these two videos COBOL Rex and maybe one or two others so if anybody out there can grant me for about two or three weeks a login to a ZOS system um, I would highly appreciate that. Number two, um, so thank you very much. Number two, um, I wanted to um, um, also mention um, the fact that I work um, uh, usually in command line. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, user interface tools or GUI tools, graphical user interface tools to run Hercules. I'm gonna, not gonna be doing any of that. Um, I'm gonna be doing the um, the bare minimum installation so that we can get things up and running. Um, so uh, so let's get started. So um, I usually start um, with obtaining a Hercules um, binary so we can get that installed. And then um, the second thing would be the terminal emulator. And the third thing would be um, uh, MBS 380 itself. So uh, if you go to this web page here, Hercules uh, 390. EU, I guess it stands for European Union, um, uh, you'll get, get to this page and you'll see that they have Windows uh, binaries, pre-compiled Windows binaries. Now, one thing you need to be aware is you need to know if your Windows is 32-bit or 64-bit. If you have um, Windows XP or Windows, sometimes even Windows 7, um, um, you are probably more likely to run it in 32-bit mode, even though those uh, Windows uh, versions also exist in 64-bit. Uh, if you have anything newer than that, you're most probably running 64-bit, but be sure to download the version that's, um, that's uh, appropriate for you. Um, so I'm gonna be downloading here this version here, Hercules 3.13, 64-bit um, installer package. Uh, this is gonna be done in about a second or so. And done. So let's start this. Accept the terms of the license agreement. Yes, whatever. Install the complete product in the default location. Uh, yes, I allow it to install. And that's about all it takes to install Hercules. Um, so this was very, very simple. Um, how do we know it's running? So to what I do here is I go here, type CMD for command. So I get a command prompt. Um, I hope you can see this. I can try to make this a little bit um, bigger font. Let me try to go for 36. Hopefully this this plays nice and big here. Okay, so um, let me see where Hercules is installed. Uh, it's probably um, Yeah. So it installs in a directory called program files uh, slash Hercules slash 
whatever the version is that you're going to download. And if I type Hercules here, um, it will start. As you can see, this is Hercules. The first time you started uh, Windows Defender Firewall, I'm running uh, Windows 10 64 bit here. Uh, Windows Defender Firewall has blocked some features. Um, allow access. Click on Allow Access. And this is it. Uh, this is already up and running. Um, so um, we can now exit. We know that Hercules works. So let's put this aside for a second. I need to make this a little smaller because 30, the font here is a little bit too big. Um, okay, so let's put this aside. Now, uh, the other thing you need to get is a terminal emulator because you connect to MBS with a 3270 um, terminal emulator. There's a bunch of those. Um, usually if you just type Google in Google 327 terminal emulator, uh, I didn't say free, um, you get this. So there is uh, the ones you have to pay for. And then there's the 32X3270 terminal emulator. Uh, be very careful where you download it from, obviously. Um, this, if you go to this website here, x3270.bgp.nu, you will land at a place where which has a Windows 3270 emulator, and you can install that, and they will work just fine. However, um, I don't like this very much. What I like is Tom Brennan's um, Vista 3270. Uh, this is an amazing terminal emulator. Uh, you can download it and use it for free for 30 days. It has a 30-day trial. So uh, you go here, you download it, and install it. I've already done that, and once you install it, you present it with, and you start it, this is how this looks like, okay? So I've already gone through that. It's extremely simple. It's like two or three mouse clicks and you're done. Um, so go here to this website, tombrandonsoftware.com. If you want a slightly better version, you type V200 for version two, and then you install this one, um, because this is able to scale to the full windows, uh, to the full screen size of your desktop, which is the version that I use. Um, so uh, this is the second step. With that out of the way, we now have to install MBS itself. That is extremely simple, just as well as the previous two steps. Um, you go to this website called WTHO Wotho. I don't know what that really means. W O T H O dot E T H Z dot ch what this means is that this is a swiss website ch stands for switzerland confederatio helvetica or something and um the old latin name for the swiss federation um, and then uh, ethz is the a very prestigious very um, well-known eth uh, it's like a technical university uh, Albert Einstein used to teach there, so this is how good this university is. And Z stands for Zurich. I think they have another one in Switzerland somewhere, so they have Z for Zurich, and I don't know where the other one is. And then this is just a host name. I don't know what that means, but um, this is where you go. Just search for MVS 3.8 TK4, and you land here. Once you land here, you get um, this downloadables here. So first of all, you have the manual, which I really advise you um, keep open somewhere. Uh, the manual is complete. Everything that's in TK4 is somehow documented here. I wouldn't say it's the most easy to read documentation, but it's complete. So um, I, it, you can't really do without this documentation. Uh, uh, my video is not going to be enough um, to, to get the full power of your TK4. What I'm going to be showing in this video is just the bare minimum to get up and running and editing and compiling a COBOL job. Um, anyway, so you go here, after you download the manual and read a little bit about it, you go to this version here, TK4 V100 current. Um, that's the current version, which uh, is right now the update eight. Um, Jürgen, the Jürgen Winkleman, uh, who is the maintainer of the TK4 distribution, is the author and uh, he keeps his webpage and he produces this um, distribution and this updates. He's been working on update nine for over a year now. Uh, unfortunately, he had a skiing accident, I think last year, and that has slowed him down a little bit. I've been helping out with testing as well as some contributions, some of the code 
um, in uh, sys2.jscl live is mine. Anyway, so uh, Jurgen is doing a fantastic job. This is this is great engineering here, folks. I, I, I am great admirer of Jurgen and many others in the community. He, this, this person really knows uh, his stuff. Um, and so uh, you download this version, current, um, and just by clicking on it, and we're gonna do it now. Now, while we do this, um, we need to set the path variable uh, so that we can always execute Hercules from any command prompt. To do that, we'll, let's go and see what is the um, path variable for Hercules. Okay, and can we copy this? Uh, oops. Ah, okay, so this way, and then copy and then we go here and we have to say path variable edit the system environment variables um, user profiles environment you go here to environment variables this step is not strictly required but I do it so that we can run Hercules from any location on the system um, and um, Okay, so we go here, we can do it here, edit, and we add this, and then um, we also edit this one, and we add the new one, and that's going to be, well, whatever we copy from here, we put in here. And now, next time we invoke CMD, we should be able to run Hercules from anywhere. Yes. Okay, so that just worked. Um, and so now I guess we can, well, we can close this. Well, actually, we need to close this one. Um, all right, so this is done. Let's see where we are with, um, with the download. It's a 228 megabytes download. There's two more parts which you can download. One is the source. It's a DASDI, um, a disk image of with the source of MBS, Jest2, and many other things. Um, and the other one is an optional CBT download. CBT stands for Continental Bank Tape. Uh, there was a bank somewhere in, in the Midwest of the US that used to produce a tape with hundreds or thousands of uh, goodies and additions and extensions and little programs and more uh, important programs in it. And um, Jurgen has created a system so that you can just download this disk image, copy it into the directory of TK4, and then you can browse the CBT tape, um, which is just, I think, just about the best and fastest way to get familiar with the CBT tape. Um, which is something that every user, every series user of MBS should do. But this is for beginners, so we're not going to get there yet. While we do this, let's mention several um, several important facts of uh, of the mainframe. So the mainframe has a different terminology. Uh, memory, it's called storage. Um, and the reason for that is really funny. When IBM I uh, created um, the first few mainframes. Uh, they didn't want to call the RAM, the memory, memory because they were afraid, marketing was afraid that people would think that um, that the computer could forget uh, things. And the reason for that is that uh, with the IBM 360, IBM switched from core memory, ferrite core memory, which is not volatile. You could turn off the computer and the contents of RAM would be preserved forever, even to this day. So you'd only install the operating system once and you only were turning on the computer and the computer would just instantly be there and the operating system would be instantly be there. They switched from ferrite core, they switched to um, dynamic RAM um, of different kind of uh, electronic um, architecture and that was volatile. And so marketing was afraid that people would think that the computer could lose its memory. And so instead of calling it memory, they called it storage. So storage is really RAM. And then disks are called DASD, okay, um, 
which stands for Direct Access Storage Device. So disks in the, uh, in the mainframe world are called DASDs, and it's just something we need to get used to. The other important thing is that the uh, MBS stands for M multiple, let's look at the wiki page. Um, MBS is an operating system which was released in early 80s. That's the version that we're running. And don't think this is an old or, um, or an obsolete operating system. You'll see very soon this is a very, very capable environment. Um, and so this stands, stands for multiple virtual storage um, because IBM uh, released back then in the 70s a version um, of, uh, of OS 360, which was the original name for the, for the operating system for the System 360 mainframe, with, uh, first of all, with a fixed number of tasks, then they had one with them with multiple variable number of tasks, which was called MVT, and they have some videos on that. I'll link to it in the description below this video. And then in the 80s, they released a new version called MVS, which was able to run multiple um, tasks, each with its own uh, protected virtual memory. And so virtual memory was a revolution, um, a step, like a leap uh, forward in the in the history of operating systems because it allowed for protection from one user to the next and it allowed for much larger uh, addressable uh, memory and also allowed for faster performance ultimately because the computer would be able to do more things at the same time and um, wouldn't be wouldn't be um, would be constrained by real RAM availability. Um, so actually virtual memory does speed up quite a bit contrary to what many other people think. So um, this is little history of the software. We're going to be running MBS 3.8, which was released, I think, in 82, 83. Um, it continued to be re uh, enhanced then. It was, first it was called, um, so first it was released in 74 MBS. Then um, the version that we use came out about 82, 83. It was called MBS 3.8, which evolved into MBS SP later on. And that was a 24-bit version, which is what we're going to be running today. 24-bit means you can address 16 megabytes of memory, which today sounds like a joke, but I can assure you when uh, in the 80s when I was running, when I was a programmer on a mainframe, we used to have on 16 megabytes of, of memory, we used to have about 100 TSO pro programs working on TSO, about 3,000 uh, users working online on the system on Kix, as well as, as, well as uh, a lot of batch processing all with 16 megabytes of RAM and all with one uh, CPU. Um, so that was uh, 60 megabytes is, 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 is actually quite a bit in the mainframe world. So, th but then um, IBM, um, people start to get to the limit of 16 megabytes and IBM released a 31 bit uh, version of MBS called MBS XA for extended architecture, which also had the vastly revamped IO um, um, architecture. Later on, they added ESA, which uh, was able to run something called memory spaces. And later on, that was increased to uh, updated to OS 390, which had TCP IP, uh, Unix um, compatibility, and then ZOS, which became a 64-bit operating system. The reason why it was 31-bit and 32 has something to do with the way that uh, tasks are being, with, with linkage and how uh, the operating system had to call um, linked module. Uh, it's too complicated to go into here. People say why 31 bit, not 32. There's a very good reason for it. Um, and 24 bit uh, also had very good reasons, even though the architecture itself of the of the mainframe at the time it was released had 32 bit had had uh, the 32 bit capability. But we're not going to go into that today. Um, so once we understand uh, this, then the other thing we need to know is the IBM S360 uh, architecture. This is how those computers used to look like. This was the CPU. It was maybe about, I would say, uh, shoulder high for this lady here, and was maybe about five feet deep. And as you can see here, maybe three feet, four feet wide. Um, you had all the switches because you were actually able to program the computer with the switches. Uh, later on, they removed that because nobody was doing that anymore. But here, down here, you had uh, uh, keys to start the computer, stop it, put in the load address. You know that in, in, in Hercules we have three, um, a three-digit uh, device address 
which later became four digits by the time it was three digits and that's exactly the three digits here you would put in the load uh, the device address here and then press on the load button and and uh, the operating system start to run anyway and this was the console back then there was no a 3270 screen console it was teletype writer um, those are disc devices and and tapes were very very important back then these are also discs um, and this is how it looked like and today um, we're going to be uh, running not on an s360 we're going to be running on an s370 this, which was released about five six years later and that's how those computers looked um, this is a real 32s uh, s370 um, which had some enhancements to it um, among one of the things that came about two years after the release of this th s370 was virtual memory support through um, uh, dynamic address translation which is the requirement for hardware to support virtual memory but other, other than that it looks still pretty much the same you had the device address here which you would have to put into load um, you had an emergency stop button which you don't push but you had to pull and once you pull that the mainframe would stop immediately and you need to call IBM to restart the mainframe you had the counters of how many hours the mainframe had been running um, this is how it looked like I saw one of these at the very first time I worked with the mainframe was still as an S370 and this is this is how it looked like um, these are all the registers and the program status words which was, and and other things which we're not going to go into here anyway so this is the computer we're going to be running our MBS on obviously it's an emulator computer uh, we're going to have um, tons of disk devices here those as you can see here this these are all disks here these are all tape devices we have two tape devices and I would say about 12 or 15 disk devices. We have three printers defined in Hercules. These are printers here. And this is tape readers and punch. Um, and this would be the computer here, back here. And this is the console uh, in this image, obviously. Um, so uh, just, just to give you an, an idea on what we're dealing with, what we're running on. Again, this is a typical data center. Lots of tapes, as you can see. When I worked uh, in the military on uh, on the mainframe we had at the time I would say about 16 or 20 tape devices and dozens and dozens and dozens of disk devices um, I would say maybe 60 80 disks um, each one of those was capable of holding I think about um, 600 megabytes or of, of, of storage so you can at the time we have maybe 30 gigabytes on those giant disk devices. Okay, so we're done with the with the uh, little introduction here. Let's look at the downloadable. So now that we have downloaded it, we can extract it. The way I usually extract is I copy everything, Control C, and then um, I'm going to be creating a new folder, new folder, MVS um, 3.8, and I just paste everything in here. And they will now copy everything in here. And before we start MBS, I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction of what's in this directory because you're going to be working on this a lot. And if you make any changes, especially to the configuration of MBS, I suggest you make a copy of this. I mean, on a modern computer, it takes about three, four seconds to make a copy. Better copy than be sorry when you start changing things. So let's start with the configuration directory. Um, there's a directory here. Um, with configuration files. This is the main configuration that uh, you're going to be working with. Um, I'm going to be open it with, opening it with... Uh, uh, how do we open this? Double click on it. And let's use WordPad, even though I hate this application. But Okay, this is the Hercules configuration, the main configuration. Um, there is a CPU serial number which has no meaning. MBS is able to read the string, but other than that, it has no meaning. The CPU model is going to be a 3033, which was the first uh, model of mainframe after the S370, which we just saw in the pictures. Um, the main size is how big is the memory? 16 megabytes. We're going to go for maximum configuration. Uh, console port, very important. This is the, the port, the TCP IP port, which we're going to be used with the terminal emulator once we start that to connect to. This is where you're going to put it in here, 3270. 
um, you can make it anything, but 3270 is kind of the almost I would say the convention in the main, in the emulated mainframe community. Um, and then other than that, um, I usually increase the number of CPUs here, and be just because I can. If I look at we look at the task manager here, you'll see that I have maybe I think about four CPUs. Um, Oops, more details. Performance, so I have eight logical processors, four cores. So, um, um, so I could uh, run up to eight CPUs on the Hercules. Unfortunately, MBS 3.8 only supports two CPUs, but uh, it supports it fault faultlessly and increases the throughput by almost two. So there's no reason not to put in two here. I advise everybody to do it. And then we have the unit uh, addresses, which are can be four or three three digits um, we do four because ZOS supports four and OS390 supports four but MBS only supported three but that's fine it's just the same uh, we have um, this is a printer this is another printer by default 000E is always a 1403 printer this is a card reader 3525 was an IBM card punch this is device 480 is our tape uh, this is another reader another punch and two more printers then we have about I would say eight uh, 32 70 screens uh, terminals defined then we have some more terminals defined which go through a special protocol which we don't, we're not going to go into here now and then we have I would say about 25 26 DASDs remember DASD stands for direct attached storage device so those are disks and they're literally images of the disks um, of, of the bits and bytes that are on the platters uh, they just they just moved into a sequential file um, and so we have several MBS res is where the operating system itself sits so we're going to be IPLing or booting from 148 IPL stands for initial program load and it's the mainframe jargon for booting you don't say booting when you do mainframe you say IPLing very important <laughs> uh, then we have paging devices then we have several just public storage devices where people store their files uh, we have the environment where the software build is being kept. We have sorting devices, which need to be 2314s, unfortunately, very old disk devices, because the IBM sort that we have in TK Forward only works with those old storage devices. But one of the um, um, MVS community members out there is writing a new sort, which hopefully will get into TK4 update nine in the next few months, which is able to do uh, to work with newer uh, storage devices. So this will be the oldest disks. This would be 3330s, the second oldest. Then you have the 3350s, which hold about 300 megabytes. 3340s, um, special disks that are similar to the 3350s. Then we have the 3375s, um, which hold also about 300 megabytes, megabytes. And then we have the 3380s, which hold 600 megabytes. And ultimately, you also have the 3390s, which can hold up to um, 9 gigabytes each. Um, and then we have this is where the definition will go from when you have the CBT tape I mentioned and the source um, and the source uh, disk with all the source of MVS. Uh, this comes may come as a surprise to many of you. MVS uh, was distributed as a source product. Um, so open source existed way before we, we used to call it open source. IBM had to release MVS 3.8 as, as open source because it contained code for which the US federal government had, had paid for and so that made it a requirement that be released into the open and that is also uh, the version that we can legally use uh, um, without any problems from IBM. IBM is allowing us to use IBM uh, MBS 3.8 legally on an, on an emulator. Uh, if you run any other any older versions of MVS such as OS 390, MVS XA, even MVS ESA and special ZOS on Hercules, you're um, infringing on the on the license for ZOS, and um, and that of course um, can get you in trouble um, with licensing costs and with legal costs, but also with DRM, um, with the Digital Millennium Act of 2000, which has draconian measures for people who infringe on licenses and copyright. So uh, you need to be careful with that. Um, so right, we change that, let's save it because I changed the two CPUs here. So I'll save this, um, save, and that's it. Um, 
Then uh, this was the conf directory. Here are the, all the disk devices in the DASD directory. Um, then uh, Hercules itself. So one of the things that I should say is that Hercules, the TK4 distribution comes with Hercules itself. It contains Hercules for Windows in, in 64 and 32 bit and it knows how to determine if you're running 64 or 32 bit. So strictly speaking, it's not necessary to install Hercules, but I did anyway because we're gonna be doing more things with Hercules later on. But if you download TK4 and you start TK4 the way I'm gonna show you in a minute, you're actually gonna run in the Hercules that comes with uh, TK4, not the one we just installed. Um, then, very important, we have here the PRT, the print directory, where we're going to have the print files, um, which means anytime you print something, the output is going to be in files, one of three files that's going to be in this directory once we start for the first time. Uh, tapes, the images are going to be in here, and, um, and these are scripts to start, um, to start uh, Hercules. So, now that we looked at this, let's get going. Um, so uh, let's start a new um, a new command command prompt. I'll make the uh, font a little bigger here. Uh, Twenty eight should be fine. Oh, you can all read this. Let's go to desktop because this is where I am, and let's go to MVS three point eight. This one. And now we go first to unattended. Very important to do this step. And by the way, if I'm going too fast, just freeze the video and do uh, exactly what I'm doing. You should be able to get this done. Um, we go in here and we set it to console mode. And, and, it's, and it's very important that you set console mode because we want to look, watch the console in the beginning to be able to interact with MBS. Because that's the, people don't understand when you interact with MBS, you really only interact with MBS through the console, not through TSO. TSO is just, like a productivity environment it's just an online tool but this is tso is not where you where you speak to mbs um, so we're gonna run this batch job which sets console mode dot bat there's one for linux and one for windows so we're gonna run uh, the one for dot bat for batch for windows and so that's done now we go back one director we we're still in the inside this folder here that i created okay and we just type MBS. MBS starts, it wants to be allowed access because it's the first time we run Hercules. And it's, why is this not working? Okay, so um, this is already started. As you can see, if I press escape, I can switch between the view of all the devices and the CPU. And I have two CPUs because I defined two, and it's already up and running, 24 million instructions per second. Um, and by pressing escape, I get the console. So anytime you want to talk to MBS, you put in a slash, and I could say display time, and I'm gonna be display the time. Now the time that you're gonna see here is 18 hours and 40 f and, f and, and uh, four minutes, which is the time in uh, in Central Europe because. Uh, as you remember, uh, we downloaded this from the University of, uh, not the University of Zurich, from ETH University. And so uh, Jurgen works on Central European time, and so the time that it shows here is Central European time. We can change that in the configuration setting if it bothers us. It doesn't bother me really very much. I don't do any production work, load, uh, work. So for me, it doesn't matter. So MBS is actually already executing. Uh, here is a very simple command to see what's running. Display all active jobs. And if you do that here, it shows you all the, all the all the workload, all the jobs that are running. Command one is a job that's related to the automation that comes with TK4. BSP Pilot is the automator that automates the console. Jest2 is the um, job submission and spooling environment that essentially takes over the whole mainframe. .NET is VTAM, which is the, the thing that is able to is it's the networking component of MBS, and then we have um, other parts. Um, and, but the other one, I'm not going to go into those because they're less important right now. But the one that's very important is TSO. TSO is time sharing option. Is the part where we can log in with a terminal and do work online. Other than that, the only other way to execute jobs would be to run them through the um, 
to run them through the reader uh, or through tape or run them from somewhere. So, um, but we're not going to get into that right now. There's plenty of videos I have in my channel that show how to submit jobs um, from the uh, from the card reader, or from the card pun, uh, from or from uh, from tape. So we're not going to do that right now, but um, we're going to connect now to the system. So we start the terminal emulator, whichever you installed. As again, I will I would suggest that you install Vista 3270 here. We go to localhost and remember to set this to 3270. Very important. If you don't put 3270, you're never going to connect. And most users actually never get past this point. So be, I, I can't stress this enough. Port 3270 has to be there. It will come by default with by default it will say 23 but that's not going to work because we said in the configuration file it's port 3270. i always put model 4 because i like this model 43 character high and 80 wide and let's connect once you say connect we're not connected um, go to keyboard edit and make sure that um, you define the control key as enter it's not like this by default and so you're going to be stumbling on how to actually submit um, stuff to the to the operating system and so what i do is i i map the enter the 3270 enter which is not the same as the pc enter on the control key okay so you go here and map it here um, and then enter is just for me just new line when you press enter on a on a on the mainframe screen enter just means go to the next line it's it's a new line it's not really enter and enter uh, for me is the control key okay very important to do that um, so when i press now um, the enter key which is mapped to the control key it wants me to log in so i say hercules 01 the default password that comes in um, is in the in the documentation but it's c u l the number eight t r see you later okay I press enter and now something you need to understand every time you work on the mainframe you want to submit something to, to the operating system you need to press enter it's not like in unix or windows when you type and the operating system can read every key press that you press um, it, it doesn't generate an interrupt on the mainframe you need to press you type something on the screen and when you're ready to send it to the mainframe you press uh the enter the the enter key which here is the control key on my keyboard and once you do that you're in here and and you see here we have several options this is the first uh, panel the screens here are called panels in in tso language and mainframe language you have two productivity environments rfe and rpf as i've said in other videos in the past i suggest you don't waste any time with option two because it's just not as good um, but rfe is very very good and in fact is even better than the i think than the ispf option on uh, on the ZOS um, operating system. We have a system monitor. Um, we have a spool browser so we can see the output. Um, and then we have various utilities and terminal tests. So we're gonna be working only with one and, th and three today. Uh, let's start with three so we get a little bit of an overview of our system. Press three we in, and you can see here it says, what is the user? This is terminal CUU0C0. There could be thousands of terminals literally attached to this right now and and it would all work just fine uh, this is the system id some people have had problems changing system id well if you change it make sure you change it correctly because um, there are comas that you need to put in this in the right place in the configuration file i'm not going to go into that right now it tells us we are running on a 3033 and it tells us when we ipl'd and the date we ipl'd and the julian date for today today is uh February 14th, um, right now it's 3.25 here in Central Time, the US. Um, we can press here G for graphical activity display and it will tell us exactly what's going on in the system. These are the jobs that are running. This is, this, this is the memory that it's using in this part. And this is the CPU usage. Right now we're using 0.4% of the CPU. And this is the device and physical channel start. So devices are attached to the mainframe through something called channels. If you can think of them as cables, but they're actually more than cables. It's tiny microprocessors that take over the handling of the input output for the central processor. And that's why the mainframes were able to handle so much workload because the processor would only process uh, instructions. And once the input output was gonna happen, it would be handled by those channels. 
um, and so the CPU was not involved. And on the obviously on the on on the on the PC architecture and um, and most other architectures out there, the CPU handles the I/O as well, and that's why they're not as scalable as the mainframe. But um, um, so this is how we look at things. F3 always takes you one level up. Okay, so very important. F3. Anytime you're somewhere, you want to go to one level up because you have to think of these panels as a tree structure. And the further down you go, you want to go all the way back up again. You need to keep pressing F3 until you go back up in the tree structure. So F3 here. And let's say I want to see um, the channels. And this shows me as I'm in start IO. Um, this shows every time I press enter, it shows me what happened. One more thing to understand is that the display devices not necessarily they can update themselves, but most likely they won't most of the time, unless for special applications are written for that. So you need to press enter every time you want to refresh the content. Okay, this is what I'm doing right now. Refreshing. And so it's showing us right now they're starting six IOs per second on this channel, which is, uh, this is a byte multiplexer and this, um, which means there's a multiplex channel, so there's more than one device attached to it. And this, I guess, will be the uh, console. Um, so uh, we go back up and you can uh, explore here I you know Herc01 this user is the privileged user so you can do some damage um, if you hurt if you enter as Herc03 or Herc04 and the passwords are in the manual um, you can do less damage but if you do if you make damage especially at the beginning you just download and install it again and start from where we just started here uh, let's look at paging Obviously, there's nothing, there's no production workload running right now, so there's very little paging. Um, MVS uh, has both paging and swapping. Swapping means moving a whole address space, a whole job out to disk, including whole TSO users could be swapped out. Um, and then there's paging, which is when only certain pages of an address space are being swapped out. Um, so what's always important is is swap out or paging out. Um, also in Unix, you don't really need to pay attention to page in because the paging subsystem is used also for loading uh, uh, executables. I'm not going to go into that right now, but it's the page out that's really that really matters. Um, so it's right now 50 page outs per se um, no no paging per second and a couple of swaps per second. Um, Okay, so we've explored the system a little bit. You go and, 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 and have fun exploring here. Um, there's a K, if you press K, oh no, uh, M, sorry, you get an overview of the system. So it tells us this is, you know, what CPU we're running on, the version of MBS, the system ID, where we IPL from, from device 140, what kind of IPL type we did, we did a quick, the job entry subsystem is JS2, there's also JS3 out there for which I have a video, how many CPUs we have, which CPUs are active. The current CPU in which we're running right now is zero. Sometimes we'll change to one. It's uh, not really deterministic. Um, and then we have a system management facility which records everything that happens on the system. There's two recorders here. Right now we're in S Sys1 Man X and then once this is full, it's now 0.6%, it will switch to the other one and then you're supposed to dump the other one to tape and switch again um, and then there's just a lot of information uh, most of it is just relating to MBS internal tables you don't really need to know all of that okay so now let's go and let's get something done um, some people have asked me how to create a data set how to delete a data set uh, let's start first of all a data set is a file and there's an MBS is a record oriented file uh, operating system meaning that the operating system understands what are the records inside a file or a data set. Uh, and this is unlike Windows or Unix or Linux, where the operating system doesn't really understand what's inside those, what the organization is inside those files. Um, the application needs to understand what's inside the file on Linux or Unix or Windows. But on the mainframe, the operating system knows that it, what is the organization in terms of records. Um, and so, um, if you want to see the files that you have, you type 3.4. So there's utilities here. And DS list, dataset list shows you, it's kind of like saying ls in uh, Unix or directory command in Windows. You type 4 here. And let's say Herc01. And then I can see all my datasets. 
Now certain data sets, like this ones, all of this ones are actually called partition organized or um, partition data set, PDSs, which means they're they're a data set that's that it's almost like a directory which can control we catch con which can contain other members in it or other files in it um, so all this contain nothing right now but i think this one will contain something e means edit okay none of these contain anything uh, and if i want to see herc 02s files i can do that b means browsing without changing or if I want to see the system configuration data sets, I press Sys1, and all these are part of the operating system. So this is the operating system installation on the disks. And they're split on several disks here, as you can see. This is the disk volume, um, and this tells you a little bit uh, how big is the petition, particular data set, well, how it's organized and how full it is, what is the block size, how many records, uh, what is the definition of the record, etc. Um, now, let's say we want to allocate a new data set. We go through 3.2, which means um, create, delete, rename, catalog, a data set. So uh, we go here, 1, 3.2. 3.2 is the same as saying 3 and then 2, okay? I can go here to the main uh, um, RFE uh, menu and I can say 3.2 or I can also say 3 and 2. Got it? So, and then we're going to allocate, it says you allocate new data set, A, we're going to call the HERC01 um, YouTube Moshis. And so, once we press enter, it asks, okay, what is the name? Um, what is the record format? I'm going to say fixed block. Um, the records are going to be 80. And, and why is everything always 80? It doesn't have to be, very often it's 80 because punch cards were 80 characters long. Um, and we're gonna make this 800 block size, meaning that in one block there's gonna be eight, uh, 10 records. Now the physical block size really depends on where we're gonna store, store this data set. I'm not gonna get into that now, I have plenty of other videos about this. Um, but you wanna be efficient um, because the geometry of the disk, how many how many cylinders are on the disk, is, and what is the size of a track inside a cylinder on the disk, is kind of important because you want to fill as much of a track on the disk. A track is like a whole circle on the disk, a whole uh, well, a track on the on the a circular track on the platter, and and you want to fill as much as possible, but not more than that. Um, but that we'll not go ahead and go into that right now. We'll leave this open. The volume, the unit will leave open. I'm going to say tracks, the size, how many tracks of this uh, or, uh, organization we're going to store. Let's say 10 tracks with a secondary space in case we fill the first one up of another five tracks. And now here's the important thing. If you say zero uh, directory blocks, it means it's going to be a, a sequential file, just like a file on on Windows or Linux. If I say 20 directory blocks, it becomes a partition data set, a partition data set like one we saw before, which can contain other files inside, okay? So now, um, remember this, herc 01 YouTube Moshix. So now if I go here to option four, data set list, and I put in herc 01 we should see our new data set. And indeed, here it is. It says it's 10 tracks used as one, because the first one track contains the directory blocks and it's 80 bytes record length and 800 block size so 10 records per block um, now we can go and and change it if we want so let's go to the editor okay we go to rfe2 and we say herc01 uh, youtube moshix um, file one Okay, now we're I'm not going to go into the manual for the editor, but understanding the editor is kind of important in the mainframe. Uh, I could easily have three or four videos just explaining all the features of the editor. Just trust me when I say this is the best editor you will have ever worked with in your life. Um, it's very similar to the ISPF editor. In fact, it tries to copy the ISPF editor, but I think it's even better. If, if not equal, uh, I would say it's also better. Um, 
it's a very simple command. I want to repeat this line and do R5 here. Um, sorry, R5 and repeats this. Now I want to indent this by five bytes. Um, this three lines, or four lines. So I say parenthesis, parenthesis five, which means when you repeat something, it means it's a block. Okay, and this I want to indent only by two. So I say right parenthesis two. Okay. Now I want to put it back. I put in left parenthesis two. Um, I want to insert a line. I put an I. Second test. Okay. So let's say I want to put this. I want to copy this at the very beginning of uh, the member. What we're looking at now is a member because it's inside her YouTube Moshix. That's the data set. And the file inside the data set is called the member. So let's copy this by putting C and before. And now copy this there. Okay. If I also want to put it after this line, I say copy and A for after. And now we also have it here as well. If I want to delete it, I, let's make two copies of it. Now I want to delete these three lines. I do delete, 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 delete. And this is gone. Let's do it again. Repeat four of these lines, and now I can say delete four, and repeats four lines and deletes four lines. Um, so this is some of the very basics. Um, to save it, you just say save, okay? And now it changes to green, which shows you that it's it's been saved. Uh, if you change something, um, it's now not saved and I save it and now this changes to green again. Uh, so that's how the editor works. Uh, if you really want to learn the editor well, you'll have to watch some of my other videos. I have over 40 videos on my channel. Um, you kind of have, they all explain a certain component of the mainframe operating system. So you should try to watch as many of them as possible if you want. I'm not trying to sell myself here, but it's kind of, I can't really explain too many things in, things in this video because this is for beginners. But okay, so we save this now. And now let's go and submit a COBOL job. So uh, there are already some examples of COBOL jobs in the system. So let's go again to option one, RFE, go 3.4 for the data set list and do sys2 JCL lib. JCL stands, stands for JC uh, job control language, which is a, a batch language that describes the workload that you want to execute, kind of like the batch language on Windows or the shell scripts on Linux or Unix. Okay, so we put in here sys2 jcl lib or lib, and it shows you that um, it found it. We're going to go in here with E, and you have a lot of example jobs in here. We're going to go find a COBOL program, the one called PrimCob Co Prim Cob 1, Prime Cob 1, which is a, a prime number generator. We say E here at the left side, press enter. And um, here is JCL, okay? What you see here up to here is JCL, job control language. What you see here is the COBOL program, which goes down quite a bit. Uh, everybody who's ever done some COBOL will recognize this immediately. So first things first, let's make sure we can find this job after we run it. So change this very first line here. After the, this two slash slash characters are a way to tell MBS that this is JCL language and it, it's it's meant to be interpreted as JCL. So we put in herc 01 co for COBOL. That's as long as this name here can be. Everything else here looks fine, but we change the message class area to H for held output so that the output will be held and we can look at it online without having to go to the print director here, um, which we could. Actually, you know what? Let's leave this as A, and we're gonna go and look at it um, in the in the folder. Um, I'm gonna switch here to the view of the of the processor. Okay. Oops. I don't know why Windows insists on making my windows bigger. Okay. Hope you can all see this. Uh, so we'll, we'll not change anything. Now, since we changed it, I wanna say that um, JCL has to be all uppercase. Um, that's kind of still uh, an important thing. 
on the on the mainframe. Um, so if I want to change this line all to uppercase, I say UC for uppercase, and this changes this A to uppercase. Um, so why don't we just run this job? And since this is class A, which means immediate execution, this will run immediately on the processor here on this window. And since this message class A means it will go on the printer uh, defined here as 00E, okay, which is in directory print, and the file will be called print 00E.txt. This is where I'm going to find our output. Um, so we can actually open this directory right now. And if you go to print, you see here there's three um, there's three files and uh, message class A is going to go into this. Now, if I open it now, obviously it's going to read what's in there now, which is nothing. And so we're not going to find the job. And if, if we open it in Notepad, and run the job, Notepad will not know that it's been changed in the meantime. So it, there's no point in opening it right now. Um, but uh, let's just keep it here so we can find it later. Um, okay, so once we're ready to run this job, which will find um, prime numbers up to, I think, 2000. So let's make this 100,000. All prime numbers up to 100,000. You can say top. We'll go to the top. Okay. We'll save it and now we'll run it. Submit or just sub. We'll submit this to MVS for execution. Okay. And it's already done. Um, so let's go find the output. And here is the output. From this job. So Herc01, CO for COBOL, and if you, if you see here, Eratosthenes error, error, receive, and this was just run now, February 18, and this is the output from the job. So first, this was sent to the COBOL compiler, and then it was, once it compiled correctly, it was linked edit as every nothing uh, new here and then it was executed um, so in the rear we have the prime numbers up to 100,000 okay so we can do this again and you will see that uh, this is so fast hundreds of thousands of fa times faster than the machine I was working on 30 years ago for almost 40 years ago if you keep an eye here on the on the MIPS um, we can do here pan rate fast so will this update much faster okay and now we execute it you will see that the MIPS rate will is going to go up here the MIPS rate is going to go up submit but it's so fast that it actually doesn't even move um, so we, we just this machine is just way too fast even though it's emulated and the emulation ratio to uh, real instructions about 1 to 100 so um, this would run 100 times faster on 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 a processor if it wasn't emulated um, but it's still lightning fast so you don't you don't really have to worry at all about speed this is how efficient the mainframe was so we can do this again and again um, and we're done okay so now if we want to look at the output however online we change this to age for health output which means it's not going to go to the printer because every time we look at a file here what it really means is that MBS sent it to the printer because it thinks this is a file it's like paper for, for, for MVS. As far as MVS is concerned, it printed to a real printer, which happens to be just a, a sequential file in our case. Um, so if I change it to H here, it's not going to go here anymore. It's going to be kept within the mainframe on a spool device on disk so we can look at it. So now um, I'm going to make a mistake on purpose. I'm going to keep this lower cap, okay, which is wrong. So just we can see what happens when something is wrong. So let's submit it. Okay, this is job four. And if you switch to the console view, we'll see here job four was started. And it tells us job fail, job not run because of a JCL error. We already know that JCL error is that we used a lower cap H instead of, of an uppercase. Um, and so by default, it goes to printer two because it doesn't know that it's H. So it still prints it to the printer, but um, Let's go print it now. Let's change it to uppercase H. 
and save it. And now we submit it again. It should be job number five if nobody else is logged on. Okay, yep. Yeah. And here it is, job number five was started and it ended all within a second, less than a second. We can find out exactly how long it took to run. So now to look at the output, we start a new session by tapping start, 3.8 for utilities and then output viewer. But I'm just gonna say three right now to make it easier for you to follow me. Eight is to display, delete or print held output. And we're gonna find our job here. We say S for select, and we see the return code was zero, which means no errors whatsoever, no warnings, no errors. And the job was executed. And it tells us here that this was started, it took a f uh, four tenths of a second to find 10,000 prime numbers. That's how fast this is. Um, and this is the COBOL compiler message. COBOL 545 of May 1st, 1972. This is when this COBOL compiler itself was compiled. Even though we know it's actually written in assembler, so it's, that's the date it was assembled. And here's the output. Okay. Um, so now if we want to go back and change something, we could press F9, which means switch. F8 to go down. Uh, I should have said this before. F8 moves you down. F7 moves you up, F11 moves you to the right, F10 moves you to the left. So let's go change here, make it only up to 100, all the prime numbers up to 100. And then in the command line, we say top, go to the top, we save it, we run it again. And we switch now again to the output viewer. I'm still there. If I press enter, so remember, the screen doesn't um, update itself. The new output is there from job number six, but we won't see it because I haven't pressed enter yet. If I press enter, you see that it's actually already there. So that's the difference to a dynamic um, terminal session as you have with Windows or Unix. I press F uh, S, S for select. I say bottom and um, and that's completion code 0C7. Okay, so this is actually good. So it, the program compiled, but there was a problem in running this program and it abandoned. Abend means at normal end. That's something you will, if something doesn't work fi fine or something, there's an error, it will produce on the, on the it will dump. Uh, and which is something also have in Windows and Unix still or Linux. If something goes terribly wrong, wrong it will dump which is the blue screen of death in Windows when it's dumping and, and for a while it's writing something on disk, that's it's dumping. And in a band, it's an abnormal hand which will produce a dump, usually. Uh, S0C7 is the reason it abandoned, which I happen to know that it's an invalid instruction or invalid address. So, it, and I know that this means that it didn't like 100. There's something in the in the logic of the, of the COBOL program which doesn't which is not able to deal with such a small quantity. So I'm sure if I change it to 1000 and run this again, save, submit, and now it's job seven, switch to the output viewer, and it's already here. And yeah, since now we went to 1000, I can see, I can say bottom. And I should, yeah, and I find prime numbers up to 1000, okay? So there is, we just exposed a logic flaw in the program. It should be able to find prime numbers up to 100. Uh, why am I not allowed to look for prime numbers up to 100? So I will, I will report this bug to Jurgen, or I will probably fix the bug and, and submit the bug fix to Jurgen Winkleman, um, so he can include it in the next version. Um, so uh, this is how you do it, and um, and uh, this is the output. Um, if you need help here, you can press F1. F1 is always help. Okay. Uh, um, so this shows you what's going on. This this one is executing. That's why it says execution queue. Okay. And this one is print or punch. Um, and um, and so this is how we look at the output. 
If we wanted to put it on the printer, we just switch F9 switch again to the source code, change it to A. Now again, remember to put it in uppercase, AUC for uppercase and submit. And now we went to the printer. Um, so this is how you get started on Windows, how you get um, MBS up and running. Um, we looked at the editor, we looked at, uh, understood how um, to work with data sets a little bit. One more question I had is how to copy data, uh, data sets or members. So that's also quite easy. We go, for this, we go to, <coughs> we go to the very top again, three for utilities. You'll see here three copy or move PDS members or data set contents. So let's do that. And I don't remember what we called it, but we can go to four, perg zero one, YouTube, uh, E. Okay, we call it file one. We're gonna, we're gonna copy file one to file two. Okay, so we go back here, three, and we call it file one. I wanna, and I put in a C here, copy into file five. Um, Oh, we cannot copy into, into itself. So we're gonna say here, CNTL um, ASM. Oh, what was it called again? Zero one. Okay, test CNTL. We're gonna copy file one into test CNTL. So free copy file one. We're going to see here, and then we're going to do uh, test CNTL. I'm going to call it file two. Ten records copied because there were ten records or ten lines in that in that member. So now we can go here DS list four perk zero one. We go to test perk test CNTL. We should find a file a member that called file two. Yeah, and here it is. Okay, I can do this. I can put 100 lines, delete 99 lines, uh, copy this after here, this after here. Okay, you get the you get the um, you get the gist of this. By the way, the editor is somewhat aware of what you're writing into it, so that's why it's able to highlight JCL or COBOL a little bit to some extent, but not um, not fully. Um, but that doesn't matter. So. Um, so that's it. Now uh, that we got this running, we can spend here. This will stay up for months at a time. Very, very stable. Uh, this is way more stable than your Linux or Unix or Windows. Uh, this machine sometimes we're running for years uh, without re-IPLing or re rebooting. But if you do want to shut down, you put in an X here to terminate. Okay, X, and you press and you type your shutdown and log off immediately and. And this will start the log off at the shutdown of the, of the of the mainframe, and this will take about three or four minutes. So you can just let it run, and um, and it will uh, do its thing. And then ultimately, once it's done, you can see here it's still executing. Okay. Um, it's going to take a while to finish. So it's ended, it's it's going down. TCAS not accepting logins. Obviously, you don't want to accept logins while you're shutting down. And you always have to remember that these were machines that were on which thousands of people sometimes were working, um, at least hundreds for sure. And and so this is all for multi-user. So you would everything is kind of geared to making sure that um, production is always up and running and and that you're running with with many users. And so you had to, you kind of had to have convention. You you would send a message. TSO has a way to send a message to a user, and you could send a message to all users saying, "Hey, save your save your uh, workload um, because we're going down." So immediate shutdown requested, and then people would log off and then wait, and and then the system programmers or like system administrators were called back then, would jump shut down the machine, did what they had to do, often maybe do a little hardware maintenance or attach a new disk device or something. Uh, physically and and then they would bring up uh, the environment back up again and they would see it on the screen when 
um, the environment was was up again because a log on screen will be presented. Um, okay, so this is uh, we can yeah. So just to end it, so this, the mainframe is coming down any second now. Um, it's going down. It's pausing for five seconds. It should be down in any second now. See the process has stopped processing transactions, uh, uh, instructions. MIPS zero. That's it. Tell me a batch shop, yes. And we're out, okay? So this is one simple uh, session on Hercules for beginners. I hope uh, that um, any of you folks who want to try MBS uh, will find this interesting. I, there's a lot to learn about the, the mainframe environment, the IBM mainframe environment. MBS is a very, very interesting and intellectually stimulating system. Um, there's so many aspects to MBS that I urge you to watch my other videos where I go into many of the details uh, of, uh, of running a mainframe, such as, for instance, one that uh, I, I would guess is interesting is um, getting data in and out of the mainframe. How do we copy from the computer from the PC stuff into the mainframe environment? How do we get it back out? Um, how to produce beautiful printout and, and many many other things how to use all the different compilers we have over 15 compilers installed on on this MBS here um, and so please watch the videos and um, and hopefully um, you'll find answers <coughs> if you do have questions please post uh, some comments below this video uh, if you like this particular video I, I ask you to please press on the thumbs up button um, also, please consider subscribing to the Moshix Mainframe channel so you get notifications of future videos. Thank you very much for watching and see you on one of my next videos. Goodbye.